Romans 1.16 is a popular verse, and rightly so, because it's really good. Let me read it for you. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Unfortunately, that last part, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, usually gets left out when it's quoted, probably because it's not sexy, but it's Bible. Or maybe because it's, you know, kind of weird and like, what's it talking about? It, it's, it's hard to understand. But here's the thing. Israel is central in the Bible. Throughout the entire narrative of God's word, Israel is a focal point. And the whole Bible is about God and his relationship with his covenant people, Israel. So this is something um, that we should normalize. This is something I want us to normalize um, or at least understand, because if we don't teach this, then we're perpetuating the false teaching that the church, you know, the body of Christ has replaced Israel or has become Israel. And that is a false teaching that's called replacement theology. And if that's true, that, uh, the church has replaced Israel, then that means that God has rejected Israel. And so the idea is that the Jews, you know, the Israelites, they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And so in turn, God rejected them. And, you know, we see in, I believe it's um, the Gospel of John, I, I believe it's chapter one, where it kind of talks about this. It says things like, Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own didn't accept him. And then, you know, of course, there's the parable uh, that talks about um, the master setting up a banquet, or maybe it's a king. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, there's this master setting up or a king setting up a banquet, and he sends out his servants uh, to go tell those that are invited, those that he invited, that his banquet is ready. And then they make a bunch of excuses and pretty much uh, deny, they don't accept the invitation. And then so the master... Uh, I believe gets a little frustrated and then sends the servants out into the country lanes or what we hear in church culture into the, the byways and the highways and um, just goes and gets everyone else. And then, of course, uh, the Pharisees, which were the, the Jewish religious leaders, they are the ones that got Jesus arrested and crucified. So that's, you know, that's the idea um, that the the israelites they rejected jesus as their messiah so god rejected them right well the answer is no and um but first let's, let's go back to um, how we didn't replace israel and i want to read ephesians chapter 2 starting in verse 11 and let's hear paul um talk on this matter let's see what paul has to say on this issue uh, because I believe that he is very clear with this. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Okay, so that's pretty powerful. I mean, this is, this is just beautiful. Um, but we could see that now we are one um, with Israel. We've become citizens with Israel in Christ. It's through Jesus and his blood that we are now one in Christ, but we're still di distinct. It doesn't mean that now I'm an ethnic Israelite. Um, you know, I didn't become, a, you know, by God's grace through my faith in Jesus Christ, I am now an ethnic uh, Jew or a descendant from um you know, the Israelites. That's not the case. Unless I am living in the land or was 
born in Israel or I'm an actual ethnic descendant of an Israelite, then I'm, I'm not. There's still the distinction, but, um, but, I'm, but now in Christ, I am one with Israel. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear. Um, and then let's look at how God hasn't rejected Israel. And we're going to look in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 1. And this is Paul, and he says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So you see here we have the Apostle Paul saying pretty much, I am living proof. I am an Israelite, and God hasn't rejected his people. And then think about the, the 12 disciples who later became the 12 apostles. They were all Jewish. And then on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the 3,000 that were saved, they were all Jewish. So no, God has not rejected Israel. He has kept for himself and is keeping for himself uh, a remnant of his people. But now let's go to um, chap I mean, verse 25 of chapter 11 in Romans. I want to read chapter 25, 26, and 27. Excuse me, verse 25, 26, and 27. So Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may be conceited. Okay, so kind of the same thing that I'm saying. I want this to be normalized. I don't want us to be ignorant about this. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Okay, so what's going on here? God is the one that has caused a partial hardening of Israel. Um, and we see that, you know, th this is God's doing in Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 9, we see that it's God who hardened their hearts. He's the one that gave them a spirit of stupor, um, eyes that can't see, and ears that can't hear. Uh, so this is God's will. He has caused this partial hardening of the Israelites. So why? Why would God do that? Because um, if he didn't do it, or he did it so that the Gentiles... Could be brought in. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, can't you just imagine when Jesus entered uh, Jerusalem for the first time, imagine if he would have just established his throne, set it up, and started reigning and ruling over all nations um, then, you know, as, as uh, king and lord over all, right? Then we, the Gentiles, would, have, would be left out. We would still be foreigners you know, to the covenant, and we wouldn't be citizens with Israel. We would be in the world without God and without hope. So God is the one who, who caused this partial hardening of the hearts of the house of Israel so that the Gentiles can be brought in. And now when the Bible uses the word Gentile, it's just to make a distinction from Israel. So, um, if you are a Gentile, so Gentiles are just all the other nations other than the nation of Israel. And this has always been God's plan. Um, salvation for all the nations, right? It has always been God's mission to bring salvation for all, but his method has been first for the Jew then to the Gentile, just like Romans 1.16 says. So his mission is salvation for all the nations, Israel and all the nations, but his method of choice, the way that he has chosen to go about accomplishing this mission of salvation for all, you know, because we know that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants all to repent. The way that he's chosen to go about doing that is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, but that doesn't mean that we are any less important or any less loved. It's just his chosen method of 
going about doing his mission. And then, you know, we read in verse uh, 26 and 27 that all Israel will be saved on the day of the Lord at the end of the age. This um, is a promise to them that will be fulfilled uh, when Jesus returns. And now I want to read a passage from Jeremiah chapter 31 just to kind of reiterate the, the two points that I just made that God did not reject Israel and we the church have not replaced Israel. Um, so I'm going to read a few verses out of Jeremiah chapter 31 and Jeremiah um, chapter 30 and 31 are both prophetic meaning they are dealing with um, the future restoration of Israel uh, that's going to take place when Jesus returns at the end of the age and it's also talking about um, God's future judgment on them because of their uh, rebellion against him because of their sins you know the dark hour that Israel uh, the dark night that they're gonna have to go through and not just Israel but the whole world um, you know before the restoration of Israel so chapter 30 and 31 of Jeremiah are talking about this future restoration of Israel and our restoration is bound up and wrapped up in their uh, restoration so I would encourage you to read um, those two chapters, Jeremiah 30 and 31, and read uh, Romans chapter 11 if you're curious, uh, you know, if you're interested of this um, topic, if you want to see more. And Jeremiah chapter 30 and 31 are, are so beautiful, but I'm going to start in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. And it says this, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So you see, the church is the bride of Christ, right? And Jesus is the bridegroom. But we see here that God was first a husband to Israel before we, the church, were ever the bride of Christ. And we also see that the new covenant that we enjoy and partially experience now in our daily lives was first promised to Israel. So you see, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And let me keep reading, verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Verse 35, this is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. So you see, we see there it is again. God has not rejected Israel. He has not rejected the nation or the house of Israel. They are his people. And this is real definitive language. Um, like, God is the God of Israel. So um, this is, this is I'll, I'll end with this. So in conclusion, the God that you and I serve as Christians is the God of Israel. I mean, how many verses are there? There is tons of scriptures throughout the entire Bible where God is identifying himself as the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, or the Righteous One of Israel, or the Holy One of Israel, right? He gives himself the title, um, I am the God of 
Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, which we know that he later changed his name to Israel. So if God had a business card, I am sure that the God of Israel would be on it, you know. Um, and here's the thing. If we are trying to be more like Jesus, and if we're going to pray prayers and sing songs that talk about, uh, you know, having the eyes of God or, or you know, God, give me your eyes uh, to see with and give me a heart your heart to love others with or break my heart for what breaks yours if we're going to pray these prayers and sing these songs and if that is one of god's purposes for us in our lives is to make us um, more like jesus and if it's a pursuit of ours as it should be if it's a goal something that we are pursuing to grow in the likeness of the son and the image of god um, you know if, if we're trying to become more like jesus and if Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus is the same today, or excuse me, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever, which means that Jesus never changes and Jesus is Jewish. You know, he's an Israelite, a descendant from the tribe of Judah. And if he is the same yesterday, today and forever, he never changes. That means Jesus is still Jewish. And if this Jesus that never changes, wept over Jerusalem, saying, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you in the way uh, a mother hen uh, gathers her chicks under her wings. If this is the heart that Jesus has, you know, for Israel, and if we want to know what's in God's heart uh, so that we can get it in ours too, then, then we need to understand that God has a special love and a special place in his heart for the land and the people of Israel, and we should too. <laughs>